today's message is part 12 in our series entitled Revealing Jesus. The Apostle John, who was one of the original 12 disciples of Jesus, had a personal encounter with the living Jesus some 60 years after Jesus' resurrection from the dead. John recorded all that Jesus told him and showed him, and we have a record of that encounter. It's called the book of Revelation, the final book of the Bible. John recorded all of it, but in the first couple of chapters, chapters two and three specifically, Jesus presents seven messages to seven local churches located in Asia Minor. We've been putting this map up on the uh, screen uh, week in and week out, showing you the location of these seven churches and beginning to, with Ephesus and working its way clockwise to Laodicea, which we'll look at today. Uh, Jesus brought seven messages, unique messages to each of these churches, speaking into their situation at the time. The reason Patmos is on there is because John had been exiled to the island of Patmos and his encounter with Jesus took place there. Well, by the way, the next two weekends here, uh, we're going to uh, devote to the question, what might Jesus say to Discovery Church today? If Jesus spoke to Discovery Church in a personal way like he did with these churches, what might he say? And I'm going to have a chance over these next couple of weeks to uh, unpack uh, some of that. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. I trust you are as well. Well, each of these seven messages, while personalized for each of those churches, it was not meant for only them. And we know that because at the end of each message, Jesus says this, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit, meaning Holy Spirit, says to the churches, plural. Although the message for Ephesus was meant for Ephesus and Smyrna for Smyrna and today Laodicea for Laodicea, actually each of these messages was actually circulated to all of the churches as it was meant for all of the churches to hear and not only for them but because we have it in our Bible, God saw a foot fit to make sure that we received the message. So this is God's word to us today. As a boy, one of the first Bibles that I was given is referred to as a red letter edition. What that means very simply is that the words of Jesus, that which Jesus has quoted as saying, are placed in red. So as you read the four biographies of Jesus, there's a lot of red letters throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's one verse in the book of Acts where Jesus is quoted. And then in the book of Revelation, we see a lot of red. For example, chapters two and three the seven messages look like this. Do you see the significance of what you're listening to? All of the Bible is inspired by God. In other words, he brought the thoughts that men wrote down. But friends, these are the words of Jesus Christ himself for the church. And therefore, we need to listen accordingly. All right? Well, Today, we're going to hear what Jesus had to say to the church located in the city of Laodicea. And um, in some respects, I would tell you that of the seven, the best, if you will, in some respects, the most important is saved for last. Okay? So with that in mind, I want you to stand with me. Stand at Winter Garden. Stand at Eliphaia. If you're at home, get out of your lazy boy. And... Um, Follow along as I read Jesus' message to the church at Laodicea, starting in verse 14 of chapter 3. <clears throat> These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. 
If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father, give us the ability now to hear, not just mentally, but deep into our soul, the profound truth of Jesus' words for our good, that we might live to the glory of your name. And in that name we pray, amen. You may be seated. So Jesus begins this message just like he begins all of the other six. He begins by introducing himself. What you'll note if you were to simply read through chapters two and three and read each introduction, you would notice that every introduction is different. Jesus says something different about himself in each introduction. Why is this? Well, the reason is, is because his introduction ties into his message. That which he says about himself ties directly to the message that he is going to convey. So in this case, he uses three words, three phrases, if you will, a threefold description of himself to the Laodiceans. He says this, verse 14. These are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. What's he saying? Well, he starts out and says, well, I'm the amen. Amen means let it be or so be it. What he's saying here is what I'm going to tell you is the final word. You can count on what I say being true. You can take it to the bank, as the saying goes. I am the amen, the final word. The reason that's true is because I am the faithful and true witness, meaning while there are many who claim to speak the truth, what you need to know is I am the truth. I am the true and faithful witness. I I am telling you the truth. That's a bold claim. What enables Jesus to make such a bold claim that he is the final word, the faithful and true witness? Well, the final statement, I am the ruler of God's creation. Some translations substitute the word beginning instead of the word ruler. What Jesus is saying there is all of creation was made by me. The only mentions in the New Testament, or for that matter, the Bible, of the city of Laodicea are in the book of Colossians, Paul's letter to the church in the city of Colossae. Perhaps the reason for that is because the city of Colossae was located just 10 miles from Laodicea. And so there's a high probability that people who made up the church in Laodicea had read Paul's letter that had been delivered to the church in Colossae a couple of decades earlier. Well, in chapter 1 of the book of Colossians, Paul wrote this. For by him, meaning Jesus, all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. What Jesus is saying here is, I am the creator of all things. Therefore, you can be assured that what I'm saying is the truth. I am the final word on all things. The question is, why does Jesus introduce himself this way? Well, the reason is, is because the people who made up the Laodicean church, what they had heard and what they believed to be true was false. Meaning, they were living a lie. They were living a lie. And so, as a result, what Jesus says to them is, you need to listen carefully to what I have to say. I am the final word. I am the faithful and true witness because not only did I create all things, I created you. And therefore, because I speak the truth and you're living a lie, you need to hear me 
very carefully. Of the seven messages that come to these seven churches, only two of them contain no commendation. Meaning there's not one good thing that Jesus had to say in the case of two churches, one of those being the church in Laodicea. Jesus has not one word in the way of commendation for this church. Not one check mark, if you will, in the well done column. In fact, look at verses 15 and 16, key verses in the passage. He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. What's he saying here? Well, the context of this time is very important to understand. Laodicea, as a city at this time, has three major strengths, unique characteristics that set it apart, if you will, from other cities, all right? While not a big city, estimate about 17,000 people at the time, it was, number one, a very wealthy city, extremely wealthy. It was a banking center. It was a, the financial district, if you will, of the entire area. In terms that you and I understand, Laodicea is Manhattan. It's Wall Street. Let me put a few pictures because over the last 20 years, there's been a lot of excavation of the city of Laodicea, and so we get an idea of, uh, of its wealth. For example, here's a city. Here's an example of, of Main Street. This is the main street that went through uh, Laodicea, and you can see by the ornate columns that line the street that this is... This is Main Street, all right, and they wanted you to know that it was Main Street. And um, then here's another shot of the same thing. You can see the beauty of the uh, area surrounding it. And then, as we've shown you before, all these ancient cities had theaters, right? Well, A to C had two. They were, one, one, one theater wasn't enough for them. They wanted two. So this one, we were there a few years ago, and I was told that actually this theater has been excavated just in the last couple of years. Uh, they found this second um, uh, theater, okay? There's a temple complex. It's very large. And um, several gods, it's believed, were worshipped in this temple uh, complex. And you can just see how ornate and large uh, that it is. And then they've also discovered and unearthed what they believe to be a church facility. And here's a couple of shots of that church uh, facility. And once again, you can see how uh, large and uh, ornate uh, it was uh, back in the, in the day. In the past year or so, actually the last few years, but only in the past year has it been made visible, there is a, a major art project. It's called a fresco wall. Uh, these uh, blocks that make up this wall were found by archaeologists, and in recent years, it was all put together. And so it is about 200 feet long in total, and as you can see, they're painted, they're carved, etc. And uh, if you go on with the pictures here, you'll notice that there are uh, ornate arches uh, around this wall, and... Um, and indications of the, uh, just the magnificent nature of it. All of this speaks to the, uh, if you will, outrageous wealth that was found in the city of Laodicea. The second strength is that Laodicea was home to the manufacturing of high-end clothing, specifically a soft, glossy black wool. To be seen wearing a coat made of this soft, glossy black wool was the equivalent of someone wearing a sweater today made of cashmere or a fur coat made of mink, okay? Uh, that was the equivalent. So high-end uh, clothing came out of Laodicea. And then the third strength is that Laodicea was home to a world-class medical school and facility, specifically a school of ophthalmology. The doctors there had invented, if we can call it that, an eye salve that treated eye conditions with great success. And people came from all over to Laodicea to have their eye conditions treated. Uh, I was told that this uh, eye salve is actually still being used today. Uh, first invented in Laodicea uh, back in the day. So when you add all this together, the high-end 
uh, uh, clothing manufacturing, this medical school of uh, ophthalmology, the fact that it was uh, the Wall Street of its day, you begin to understand why this was such a wealthy community. This has significance for the message that Jesus is going to bring. Well, while these were three strengths in Laodicea, they had one major weakness. And that major weakness was water, or should I say, the lack of water. They had no source or uh, immediate source of water uh, in the city or immediately right around the city. And so as a result, all of their water, all of their drinking water had to be piped in from nearby cities. What were those cities? Well, one of them was Colossae. The other was Heropolis. And so you see here in a map coming. Colossae is located 10 miles to the south. Heropolis is located six miles north. In fact, if we go back to that shot of the temple that we showed you a few minutes ago, you'll notice that white uh, block there in the background. Um, that's the city of Heropolis. And I'll explain in a few minutes why it's white. But anyway, that's um, uh, in, the, in the background there um, showing you how close it, it was, okay? All right, so this water was, uh, was piped in from these two cities, all right? Now, from Colo Colossae, 10 miles away, what was piped in was cold, spring-fed mountain water from Mount Cadmus. That's Mount Cadmus, and this little mound in the front is what they believe to be the unexcavated city of Colossae. So the water would flow down into the city. It was then piped, and this is what that mountain spring water uh, looks like. That's an actual picture from Mount Cadmus of the water that flows down. It looks pretty good, doesn't it? Anybody thirsty? Okay, hold on. Don't leave, okay? But uh, anyway, it looks, uh, looks good, okay? Now, on the other side of the equation is Heropolis. That was six miles to the north, and Heropolis was the home of natural hot springs, you wonder what those hot springs look like, there's a picture. And if you go there, you can actually walk, which I and those that were with me, John Parrott, um, Ben Markham, we, we walk those pools, they're about 95 degrees, they're like, a, they're like a bathtub, a very big bathtub. Here's another shot of the, um, of the hot springs. Now, right around it, you wonder what all that white is. What happens is, as those hot spring waters cascade down the, the hillside, the mountainside, it turns hard, and that's called travertine. And so that's why that white area is what you see in the background. When you look at that temple area, you see the, the, uh, the travertine. Okay? All right, so what's happening here is this. From Colossae, cold mountain spring-fed water was being piped to Laodicea. From Heropolis, hot springs water is being piped to Laodicea. What do the pipes look like? The pipes look like this. There's a couple more shots here of the piping that was um, evidenced. It's exciting to see the Bible come alive, doesn't it? With uh, the real pictures of what's um, been unearthed, okay? All right, so here's the point. By the time the cold water arrived from Colossae, by the time the hot water arrived from Heropolis, the temperature of the water was lukewarm. The cold water had gotten hotter. The hot water had gotten colder. The result was lukewarm water. And not only was it lukewarm, but because it had gone through those pipes and there was sediment in those pipes, when the people would drink the water, they would in effect say, yuck, and they would spit it out. It just wasn't good tasting water. Now, we all get this, right? How many tea drinkers do we have? Okay, oh, well, man, Really? Hot tea, great. Okay, iced tea, great. Lukewarm tea, yeah. How many coffee drinkers? Whoa, coffee addicts? That explains why you're at the 11 o'clock service, okay? <laughs> Hot coffee, great. Cold brew, great. Lukewarm coffee, yeah. How about pop? 
By the way, it is pop. For those of you who call it soda, you're wrong. Change your ways. Okay? And for those of you who consider all pop to be Coke, you're wrong too. Especially for those of us who like Pepsi or root beer over Coke. All right? I'm just saying, friends, we're going to speak the truth around here. Okay? <laughs> just speaking the truth around here. All right? That's why when it comes to pop, you don't see this on your store shelves. Nobody wants to drink lukewarm pop. So we get this. So Jesus says to those who made up the church in Laodicea, you taste like lukewarm water. And as a result, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Now this is often misinterpreted. Many people interpret these couple of verses as Jesus saying, I wish you had no faith at all, cold. Or I wish that you had great faith, hot. But because your faith is little, or because your faith is great, not great, you're just lukewarm with regard to your faith. That's not what Jesus is saying. This isn't a measurement, if you will, of faith. What he is saying is this, you haven't completely rejected me, meaning you aren't cold toward me, but on the other hand, you haven't completely embraced me, you aren't hot toward me. Put another way, you don't see yourselves as unbelievers, cold, yet the truth is you aren't believers. And I would prefer that you either saw yourself as the unbelievers that you are or as the believers that you aren't. But the truth of the matter is you're in the middle, lukewarm. And as a result, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Jesus goes on, verse 17. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. What Jesus is saying here is, your wealth is blinding you to your need for me. Let me give you a little context here, it's important. An earthquake hit Laodicea in 60 AD. John is writing here, his encounter with Jesus, around 90 AD. Well, this earthquake that hit Laodicea in 60 AD was very destructive. It leveled much of the city. Well, the history books tell us that the Roman government came along and said to the people of Laodicea, we're going to send you money to help you rebuild the city. How did the Laodiceans respond? They said, thanks, but no thanks. We have it covered. We have enough money in the bank to take care of it. So appreciate your offer, but we don't need your help. Meaning government stimulus checks, these go back a long way, friends. These go back a long way in time, okay? So Jesus says to them, you say I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. You see, this was a city of self-sufficient people. And that sense of self-sufficiency had infiltrated the church. And what Jesus says to them is, you think because of your wealth that you don't need anything. He says, the truth is this. It goes on, verse 17. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked you're a wretched people, meaning you're in a very unhappy and unfortunate state. You are actually deserving of pity. You're poor. You think you live on Wall Street, but truth is you're homeless. You're blind. While you boast of your school of ophthalmology and the salve that you invented, truth is you can't see. And finally, you boast of your cashmere sweaters and mink coats, 
your high-end black wool, but the truth is you're walking around naked. Now, question, how do you think the people who made up the church of Laodicea received those words? When they read that list of five descriptive words about their condition, how do you think they responded? Wretched? Unhappy and unfortunate? Us? Um, deserving of pity? Us? Poor? Us? Blind? Us? Naked? Us? Friends, their response to Jesus' description of their condition would have been, Jesus, if there's any group of people in all the world of whom those statements are not true, it's us. We're the most fortunate of all people. We're not to be the least bit pitied. The Roman government offered to help, and we didn't even take it. Blind? <laughs> We're treating eye conditions, and people are seeing naked the clothing that we're men manu- no 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 Jesus friends this is why when Jesus introduced himself he said I am the amen the final word it's why he said I'm the faithful and true witness it's why he said I'm the creator of all things you see his message to them was one that they were going to have a very difficult time hearing and believing Everything about the message that Jesus had for them was going to strike them as false. And yet what Jesus was saying to them is, what you believe is false. I'm telling you the truth. What he was saying to them is, you're a self-sufficient people. Not good. But the greater problem is that you're a self-deceived people. You don't see the truth about your condition Spiritually speaking, on a scale of 1 to 10, you think you're a 10. Reality is, you're a zero. You're a long way from the truth. So what's Jesus' counsel to them in light of this? Well, verse 18, he gives them three bits of counsel, all relating to their three great strengths of wealth, clothing, and eye treatment. He says, first of all this, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire so you can become rich. What's he saying? What he's saying is, true wealth is not found in your bank accounts. You've aimed your entire lives at the acquiring of wealth. You have significant bank accounts. But you don't understand, when it comes to your spiritual condition, that wealth that you've accumulated is blinding you to your true need for me. You need to buy from me the wealth that only I can provide. Second, he says, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. As for white clothes, obviously Jesus is taking a bit of a shot at their black wool. In the Bible, we read that the righteousness of Jesus is described as being clothed in white. In addition, deeds, the Bible explains, reflecting the righteousness of Jesus are deeds done in the light, not in the darkness. Remember that Jesus has already said to them, I know your deeds, and then he had nothing good to say. And then he finally says, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see, meaning the enemy has blinded your eyes to the truth of who I am. The enemy has blinded you to your need to be saved. I think of 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, where we read, the God, small g, of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is in the image of God. Friends, bottom line, don't miss this. The church in Laodicea was made up of unbelievers in Jesus who thought they were believers in Jesus. 
The church was made up of unbelievers in Jesus who thought they were believers in Jesus. Now, at this point, we come to the key turning point, if you will, of Jesus' message. I say that because if the message were to stop here, or if you were to stop reading at this point, you would draw the conclusion that based on what Jesus has said up to this point in time, that he has no use for these people, that he's rejecting them, that he is repulsed by them. In fact, he's already said what? I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. I want nothing to do with you. Get out of my life, if you will. That would be the impression we have, right? But yet that's not what Jesus thinks or feels about these people. As we go on in verse 19, this is what we read. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Jesus said, the reason why I'm bringing you these hard words about your condition is because I love you. Not because I'm rejecting you, not because I'm condemning you, it's because I want to awaken you out of my love for you to your true condition. I want to see you set free from your self-sufficiency and your self-deception. I want the veil that's covering your eyes to be lifted. I want you to put on true righteousness. I want you to be able to truly see who you are and who I am. I want you to understand your need for me. He loves them so much. He speaks this truth to them to help you try to feel what this is like and why Jesus would do it. Let me just give you a little analogy. Imagine for a moment that you have a loved one who's dying of cancer. The cancer was discovered very late, so late that no significant treatment could really be done. They're they're way down. So the doctor, in effect, said, you know, it's only going to be weeks and maybe a few months, but, you know, you need to get all your affairs in order because this is the end. Now, imagine if that same doctor, around the same time of revealing all of that, then said to you, you know, when, when you came in to see me a couple years ago, we did some x-rays and things, did your blood work. I saw the evidence of cancer, but I thought that I, if I mentioned it to you at that time, it would be upsetting to you, so I decided not to mention it. What would you say? You, you what? And if that was your loved one who got that word, would it not be true that at that point in time, someone would have to hold you back from doing some harm to that doctor? You held back the truth to me because you thought I'd be upset? Friends, Jesus isn't bringing the truth to these people because he's rejecting them. He's bringing the truth to them because he's accepting them. He loves them. He wants to set them free from their condition, which is, in fact, wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. He says, those whom I love, I rebuke, and I discipline. So be earnest and repent. Be honest with yourselves. Take a look in the mirror. Take a true selfie and repent. Turn from your current ways of thinking. Acknowledge your arrogance and your boastful pride and self-sufficiency. Realize that your lives are aimed at the wrong target. And turn your life's direction toward me in true belief. The last two weekends, John unpacked Jesus' message to the church in Philadelphia. You might remember, and John made this clear over the two messages, that Jesus had nothing but good things to say about the church in Philadelphia. It was all commendation. There's no rebuke. Why? Because they were the true church. Jesus now, in the heels of that, writes to Laodicea. He has no commendation, all rebuke. Why? Because they're the false church. They're not the real thing. Had they outright rejected Jesus in his message of salvation? No. But had they truly accepted Jesus in his message of salvation? No. But they thought they had. 
And so Jesus says this to them in verse 20. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Jesus says to the Laodiceans, I'm standing at the door of your life. I'm knocking on the door, and if you open the door and let me in, I will come in. And the language here in Greek, referring to this meal, is not a fast food meal. This is a meal like a nine-course feast. The message that Jesus is trying to communicate is, I'm going to come in, and we're going to do life together. We're going to have fellowship with each other. My brother and I shared a bedroom as we were growing up, and I remember a a painting that my parents had put on our bedroom wall as young boys, and it sat there for for all of our years growing up. It was a painting by an artist named Warner uh, Salmon, and this is the painting. And I want you to look carefully at that picture because something's missing. Something that you would normally see on a painting like that is missing. And it's missing by design. The painter, Mr. Selman, intentionally didn't put it on there. What's missing? A doorknob on the outside of the door. There's no doorknob. Meaning, Jesus can't let himself in. The only doorknob is on the inside. The owner of the home. Only the owner on the inside can open the door and invite Jesus in. And so he says, I stand at the door and I knock. And if you open the door, I will come in and I will dine with you and you with me. Friends, I believe this message to be a really important one for not only us, but for all churches, specifically churches in America today. Why do I say that? I say it out of concern for many, many people who attend church, church services like this, who have heard about Jesus, who have heard the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And those people would acknowledge that, yes, I believe Jesus is the Son of God and that he died on a cross, Good Friday, and that he rose from the dead, Easter, and that he paid for sin. They would say, yes, 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 yes to all of that. And yet, many of those same people have never truly put their faith in Jesus as their Savior or surrendered their life to him as Lord And friends, for anyone of whom that's true, there are people going through life right now who think they're in the family of God, but the truth is they're out. And to the degree that that's true for anyone here today listening to this, I want to tell you if that doesn't change, you're in for what I call the world's worst surprise. What's the world's worst surprise? Jesus refers to it in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, where he says this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evil doers. And this verse says there will be many people, Jesus' words, who are going to stand before God on judgment day fully believing, expecting, based on their life experience, based on what they bought into, that they're in. But yet on that day, Jesus is going to say, I'm sorry, I, I don't know you. Depart from me. I gave a message on this passage some years ago, and I entitled it, The World's Worst Surprise. Do you understand why that's the world's worst surprise? Because, friends, at that point, it's too late. You 
You know what's the most troubling word in that passage, I believe? The word many. How many is many? I don't know. But I know it's more than a few. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. And Jesus says, I'm going to turn and say, depart from me. I never knew you. Bad time to find out the truth. And so Jesus gives a message to the church in Laodicea, and he says, in effect, that's you. I am the amen the faithful and true witness, the creator of all things. I love you. Awaken to your true condition. In the book of 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writes these words, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. How do you test yourself? How do you do an examination of your heart? As I close, let me, let me ask five questions. It won't take long to talk about each one. Five questions to help you examine the reality of your faith in Jesus. Question number one, do you see your need for Jesus? Do you understand, spiritually speaking, the reality of your condition that you are, I am, wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked, and apart from Jesus, I have no hope? Do you understand that? Do you see it? Do you get it? Question two, do you take Jesus and his words seriously, heart attacks seriously? Or do you say, well, you know, I, I kind of pick and choose. You know, there are things I like in the Bible and things I really don't like or agree with. And, you know, when, when it's convenient for me and it works out of my schedule, yeah, you know, I can buy into the God thing. Do you take Jesus and his word seriously? Question three, is your conscience troubled by sin? When you find yourself in a place of sin, do you find yourself kind of grieved in your spirit? And even sometimes when it's tough, you say, you know, I, I, I need to confess my sin. I need to repent and turn from it. Or do you find yourself saying, ah, you know, boys will be boys, girls will be girls. Yeah, you know, everybody does it. True believers in Jesus, sin does something to the human conscience of a person who believes. Question four, do you have a heart's desire to engage in the things of God? What do I mean, the things of God? Well, around here we refer to them as the six practices of a disciple. Abide. Do you have a desire to have a, a relationship with Jesus, to grow in your relationship with Jesus? Do you have a desire to gr gather together with others in a service like this? And not just when it's convenient, but is it a conviction in your life? Do you have a desire to fellowship with other believers, to be in relationship, to belong, as we call it? Do you have a desire to give? Do you have a desire to serve, to participate in kingdom work? Do you have a desire to invite people who are on the outside of God's family that they might be, be made aware of God's love for them? Now, I want to make very clear, and understand me on this very clearly. Don't miss this. Friends, you and I are not saved by our good works. Meaning we can belong and give and attend and serve and invite, but if the motivation for doing those things is in order to earn God's favor, it's not going to do it. But doing those things as evidence of what we know God has done for us in other words, it's a product, not the, the pursuit, but the product of our faith in Jesus. That's a good thing. Finally, question five, do you see evidence, fruit, of the Holy Spirit's presence and power in your life? Do others see it? If you were brought up on charges of being a follower of Jesus, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Is God's presence and power in your life clear? 
Jesus closes his message by pounding, pointing out the reward that is coming to those who are true believers. He says this in verses 21 and 22. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Overcame. What, what did he overcome? What will I overcome? Friends, he overcame sin and its consequences, and he overcame the grave. And those who are true believers in Jesus will overcome bondage to sin and overcome the grave. And then Jesus finishes his message with the familiar words, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Are you listening? Are you listening? Are you a true believer in Jesus? I'm going to put up on the screen a written out, if you will, what we would call a prayer of salvation. If you take a look at that, and I wanted to give you a moment to read this on your own. God, I see my need for Jesus. Salvation is offered only through him. I've chosen to live my life, my way, doing what I want according to what I think is right and best. I choose to walk away from those sinful ways, and I ask for your forgiveness offered through Jesus' death and resurrection. I accept you, Jesus, as my Savior. And I now acknowledge you as the Lord of my life. Jesus, from this day forward, you are in charge of my life. I choose to live my life in relationship with you and surrendered to your will. Thank you for giving your life in exchange for mine. Thank you for saving me from my sin and giving me the hope of eternal life with you. Thank you for the gift of your presence in my life through the person of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for all you have done and will do to help me follow you. Amen. Now, friends, those are only words. And just because anyone says those words doesn't mean they're saved. However, when those words are the reflection of what is bound up in your heart, then according to Romans chapter 10, we read this. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So do those words, put them up there again. Do those words reflect your heart? If so, then all indications would be that you're a true believer in Jesus Christ. But if not, just because you said those words, just because you attend a church service, just because you read your Bible, just because you fill it in, doesn't constitute true belief. Friends, this message, the last of the seven, as I said in the beginning, in some respects is the most important. Why? Because what you do with the content of this message will determine your eternal destiny. And if you wonder how long that is, Oh boy. This life is like an afternoon in the park in terms of its duration compared to eternity. In fact, it's less than that. Let me have you bow your heads for a moment across all of our campuses. This is serious business, and I want to just give you a moment. Perhaps today is the day when for the first time you embrace those words in your heart. And with everybody's head down, eyes closed, if today is the first day in which you, in the sincerity of your heart, prayed that prayer, I want to ask you to stand, to have the courage to stand here at Sand Lake, Winter Garden, Alafaya. If it's true online, you're watching at home, and stand at home. Thank the Lord for those of you who are standing.
Welcome to the family of God. I want to invite everybody to stand. Everybody to stand. And if you made that decision, as some of you indicated, by standing, we're going to put a QR code up on the screen here. I encourage you to take a picture of that. We'll get word of that because we want to follow up with you. We want to come alongside you. Being, being a follower of Jesus is not an, it's not an individual sport. It's a, this is a team game. We want to come alongside you. We want to walk with you. We want to help you grow in your newfound relationship with Jesus. Here at Sand Lake, in the, in the seat back in front of you, there's a little card. Or in the, the front of the auditorium at Winter Garden in Alfea, there's a card you can get. Or as you're walking out, a card you can get, including a brochure, discovering a relationship with God. Grab all those. Turn them into us and let us know so we can follow up with you and help you walk. All right? Well, as we wrap up the service today, we're going to sing a a classic song, a song of, um, of, of years gone by. We don't sing it that often, but it's a song of, that's lyrics are serious business. It's entitled, I Have Decided. I have decided to follow Jesus. Though none go with me, the world behind me, I'm going to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. And so if you're able to sing this song from the sincerity of your heart today, then let it rip. Let it rip and let God know that you're all in. Amen? Amen.